Um, as you know, we've been talking about prayer and uh, how grace grows through our prayer life. And so I want to talk to you more about that this morning. I want to talk to you about how wonderful it is. I remember way back when, when I was uh, first pastoring, we started what we call the Hour of Power. I've told you about this before. And uh, we started the Hour of Power with the thought in mind that we would pray for the service on Sunday, but yet it became a service in itself. We saw as high as, as many as 75 people coming to that service, and we and on Sunday morning in a church of 150 to, to uh, 175 at that time, I want to tell you that you get 75 people that are prayed up, ready to go, and I want to tell you, you they Amen. come in their charge. Yeah. Amen. In charge. Amen. And so um, there were many, many times where they were so charged up that it, you know, I've decided that it's probably, it's probably um, easier to tame a wild stallion than it is to get a donkey moving. Right. <laughs> you understand the analogy there? As far as church? Now, I'm not calling any church a donkey. <coughs> or, <laughs> or... I'm not calling anybody that. But I would say that... And it, it was just like 75 wild stallions coming in there. It was great. And it was... And I saw just the amazing work of God happen with a young pastor... That didn't know what he was doing. That would that would just struggle to death to, to even scratch out a service. And pray to God that it can't turn into a testimony service on Sunday night. Because it was hard, man. I mean, coming up with two, three of those things all the time. But you know what? God helped us and God blessed and God moved. And it changed people's lives forever. But the greatest thing that I can honestly say is when I heard my name mentioned in prayer. I would go in there and they would say, oh, God, bless our... Now, you have to realize I'm in Florida. So we had a lot of blue-haired people. And, and good people, but blue. And, um, and, and so they would, they would pray for me and they would pray, God, bless our young pastor. He don't know what he's doing. No, they wouldn't say that. They would say we love him so much and all that kind of stuff, and they did. And and it was really funny because I came from a, a place in which I was the darling grandson of everybody to coming in first where I was an older guy. That was weird. And uh, I found out that... Uh, that uh, that there was just a difference there. And, and anyway, when they would pray for me, there, there was just something inside of me that welled up on the inside of me that would, that would do something that I cannot even begin to describe. So when you guys text me on, on Saturday, it, there is something that wells up inside of me that I can't describe. I think that everybody wants to know that they are prayed for, but also that their prayers are getting through to God, don't you? Right. Amen. Um, I want to start out by saying a businessman was troubled by an upcoming important deal for his company. And so he went to church to pray for God to help him. By chance, he knelt down next to a man who was praying for $100 to pay for an urgent death. When he overheard the poor man's prayer, the businessman took out his wallet and pressed a hundred dollars into the other man's hands. Overjoyed, the man got up and left the church. The businessman then closed his eyes and prayed, And now, Lord, now that I have your undivided attention. <laughs> uh, when, I, when, when we pray, when I pray, I want God's attention. Yep. I want to feel that God is there and that he's listening to me. Have you ever been talking to somebody where, where uh, they, they're, they're all over the place, they, they're, they're looking all over the place, or whatever it might be, they just they look everywhere except for you in the eye. You don't know that they're listening to you. I, 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 as a matter of fact, I've said before, and I'll say it again, 
When you have that happen, just tell somebody that their hair is on fire. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then you'll really know if they're listening to you or not. But um, I want to know that God is listening to me. But there are people who have told me that they weren't quite sure God was listening to them. We have uh, described their feelings as if their prayers had just never made it up past the ceiling. Have you ever been there? I have. Yep. Where you just feel like it, it, this is doing no good whatsoever. All of our prayers are important to God, but this morning I want to introduce you a, a praying that will get God's attention. I think it, it all the time it gets God's attention. But I want to talk, talk to you about um, praising God and focusing in on the spiritual attributes of your life as opposed to just the material attributes of your life. I, I'm amazed at our, our world. Uh, I, I've watched the, uh, the presidential debates and I've watched all of that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm amazed at, the, at where our world, where our United States is at right now. Amen. I, uh, Amen. In fact, I, I get a little discouraged sometimes at where we're at. Yep. yep. Um, re regardless of who you want as a, a candidate, I, it doesn't matter to me. It, it really doesn't. But I was thinking about, we have a, a, a one candidate that is very, very rich. And, uh, and so we have heard that he would make a, success, a successful president. And, uh, and we, we base that judgment on the fact that that candidate is very rich. Now, I'm not going to get into, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to get into if he's good or bad or right or wrong. I don't, I don't want to do that. But it is amazing to us, to me, that even us as believers, that we believe that a person's success is tied in to their wealth. Yep. If that was the case, uh, I don't know if you, all of you know who El Chapo is, but El Chapo was, was arrested, and he is the biggest kingpin in, in South America for, for drug smuggling. El Chapo is very rich. So maybe he should run for president because he's very rich. And maybe we should say he's successful because he's very rich. I, I think that what we've done is that we have taken the world standards, and we have taken the world standards, and we have jammed them into the Christian church, and we have said, this person is a good person because of the status they have on the outside world. Right. Now, riches aren't wrong. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying they're wrong. Right. But what I am saying is, is that that, doesn't, that is not a sign of godliness. We are not in the Old Testament in which you could look out and see how many donkeys a man had, and how many horses, and how many pigs, and how many, or they didn't grow pigs, I guess, uh, because they were bad. They were, I don't know, have you ever read that cloven hook and yes. chew their cud? It gets me confused. What in the world am I supposed to eat? <laughs> Plant bread, probably. No bread? Bread's out. Okay, well, I won't eat that then. Well, I'll just starve to death, I guess. But anyway, it is amazing to me how we have taken the world standards and that we have jammed them into the church and said that somebody is extremely successful because of the riches they have accumulated. Now again, I want to re-emphasize, I am not for or against any single candidate. I'm not. Well, I lied there. Yeah, I am for one. <laughs> I'm just trying to not be political here. But I'm saying this. What kind of prayer would accomplish that we would get through to God? What kind of prayer would absolutely get God's interest in us? Listen. In Paul's prayer, he prays for us, and what he prays for is he prays for the church. And the church, uh, understandably, is you and I. He calls it the bride of Christ. It's you, and it's me, and it's all of us. All of us that are sitting here today 
have come to a church and we are part of a bigger church that we call the Catholic Church, not with a not with a not the Catholic Church as we think, but the universal church. And the universal church is the bride of Christ. And listen to how Paul prays for a church in Ephesus, but he's not praying for only a church in Ephesus. He is praying for the church in general, the universal church Amen. that's going to come years and years and years and years after that. <laughs> and he prays this way. Listen to this. And I want to go by this kind of slow. Now, he starts out, he probably knew I was going to preach on God's grace, and, and, and this was going to be the year of grace grows, and so he probably wrote this just for us. <laughs> but he, said, he starts out and he says, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading the good news. Though I'm the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them. I was chosen to explain to everyone the mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom, its rich variety to all unseen rulers and authority in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly. Did you hear that? Boldly. We can now come boldly and yeah. confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. Paul's prayer for spiritual growth. When I think of all of this, is what he says, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. Now I want us to take note how he's praying here. He's not praying for your physical things in life, though those things are important. I want to show you what he's praying about and the things that are most pressing to him. He is praying for spiritual attributes that the church of Jesus Christ might have. Amen. Listen to what he says. I pray from the glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with his inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to understand all of God's people should how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all of the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all the glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. That means you and I who sit in the church today and this March day in 2016. All the glory to the church and through all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 Yes. Isn't that a marvelous prayer? Amen. Amen. No, he didn't say, you know, it'd be nice if, uh, if Scott Crothers down through the generations would have a few extra dollars. He didn't pray that. He prayed for spiritual needs of his people. Right. Yes. Because he knew that if the spiritual needs of his people were taken care of, then all of the other things will fall into place. Amen. In verse 8, Paul says this. Amen. Preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone that administration of the mystery. What was the mystery? The mystery was is that Christ was for everybody, right. for all generations. Amen. Amen. And he was not at that time, he was not the king of, he was the king of the Jews, but the, until Pentecost, you see, when the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the very bottom, until that time, God was a minister to the Jews. But I want to tell you what happened. 
He ripped the veil from the top to the very bottom. Amen. And when he did that, he got out into our world. Yes. Yours and mine. Yes. And he ministers to not only the Jewish nation, but he ministers to you and I as well. Come on. Now, does he still love the Jewish? Of course he loves the Jewish people. But he also loves all of those other individuals as well. Amen. He even loves people in the United States. Can you Hallelujah. He loves us all. Yes. And so the mystery was that what had been hidden from the very ages was is that the Son of God would come and die on a cruel cross and then say, it is finished. But it wasn't necessarily finished. Come on. Amen. Because one day, not only did he die, but he was resurrected, Amen. and his power lives in you and it lives in me. Amen. And that's what he talks about in this whole scripture. Verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father. What Paul is saying, the real reason I'm praying this particular prayer, because God has a goal, an objective for each one of our lives. Yeah. Right. Do you know, folks, that he has a purpose for every single one of your lives? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I was saddened by the fact that Carrie Fields went home to be with Jesus this week. I was saddened by that. Quite a bit. In fact, when I walked out of there, I walked out of there, and God started to speak to me and change me in a very profound way. He does that most of the time when, when somebody I know has went on to be with Jesus. Because I don't know how long I'll be with you. I don't know how long you'll be with us. Yep. He does that to me every single time, but this time it was a little bit different. I realized that, you know, it really is true that we don't know the time, the day, or the hour that God's going to take us home. Right? Amen. Home right. Amen. But until that time, I want to get to be intimately close to not only Him, but to you as well. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. God has a new goal, an agenda. My father-in-law and I speak, we speak in deep theological terms. Not because I'm deep and theological. My father-in-law is deep and theological. And so we talk about that. And I said to him, exactly what Warren says, and so I, I think uh, I'll take Ed's young advice when he said, thou shalt pirate always. That's one of the ten, ten commandments that he has. So I pirated for Warren, and I, and I, and I, thought I would use it. The only reason why any of us, any of us, are still on this earth, there's only one single reason that any of us are still on this earth. And that is because you have a purpose in this world. Amen. 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 That's the only reason why you live. Yes. You have a purpose. Amen. Yes. Yes. And it's not just to, it's not just to live and take a bear and eat the pizza and, and, and then go home. It's, that's not it. Right. You and I have a purpose. Amen. And it is our responsibility to figure out right. and to pray to God and yes. ask Him what our purpose is yes. in this Amen. life. Yes. Amen. Come on, Pastor. Now, my father-in-law is 90 years old. And he, he, 90 years he served a purpose in this world. Right. That's a long time. Yep. I don't know if I want to serve a purpose for that long. But he is. Listen to what God has a goal. God wants everyone to know the riches that can be found in Christ. And he wants the mystery of his salvation to be so plain and so obvious that others will understand it in a way that us Christians have. Amen. That's what God wants. And Paul is praying focused on achieving that objective. Yes. But wait a minute, Scott. I thought you were going to talk about my prayers, about the things that I want when I pray. Well, I am. Listen to this. When you're in a conversation with someone and you want to get their attention, what should you talk to them about? What will get you interested in what you have to say? Them. You talk about them. Amen. 
Really? Mm -hmm. well, now we say it's not all about you, but really it's all about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want to talk to somebody about something, you talk about them. So how are you doing? What's the kids doing? The grandkids? All of that kind of stuff. You talk about them. But Jesus said that our relationship with God works in much the same way. As a matter of fact, he said to enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving for what he's done. In other words, you talk about spiritual things before you ever talk to him about, I need a new pair of shoes. Right. Yeah. Come on. Right. Yep. Come on. And so he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. 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 In other words, if our lives and our prayers are focused on seeking God's kingdom first, then we'll get God's attention, and we get His attention, then He promises He, he will give us what we need. Amen. 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 Not what we want, but what we need. Amen. Come on, Pastor. Even Jesus prayed that way. Do you remember the night Jesus was betrayed? He prayed three times that God would remove the cup from Him. Right. And three times God said, no, you've got to go through with this. And then what did Jesus say? Jesus said, then I want your will right. and not mine. Right. Yep. Come on. Amen. You're going to have to come to a point in your life where you say to yourself, I want God's will in my life, right. not my own. Right. Amen. Amen. And I surrender to God's will. So when Paul prays this prayer in Ephesians 3, he's asking for God's will to be done. Listen to this. God wants everyone to know the wonderful, how wonderful Jesus is. And God wants that message to be so plain and so obvious that others will understand and want, want what we Christians have. Yes. Right. Amen. Come on. God help us. I'm going to read that again. Yes. Come on. <laughs> you sang two songs. I can read this Absolutely. again. Amen. <laughs> God wants that message to be so plain and so obvious that others will understand it and want what we Christians have. Amen. 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 Help Amen. us, Lord. Help us all. Stole it from man. So it's got to be true. There was a guy by the name of Martin E. Moeller. Martin E. Moeller was serving in World War II, and he was uh, he was a um, he was a prisoner. He was confined and went through terrible torture and all of that. And so finally the war was over and the people were released from bondage. <coughs> Martin Amola suffered terribly. And when it, while he suffered, um, there was a group of individuals, press, that came to the, to the place where he was jailed and, and, and he talked to them. <coughs> finally... They talked to him for about three hours, and, 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 and they became more and more and more frustrated. And finally, one of the reporters came out with us. The people watched, and he busted his pencil, and he said, After three years in a Nazi concentration camp, all that man can talk about is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I love Amen. that story. Amen. You mean to tell me after... All we've been serving Jesus, all we've done, the world cannot see what we've done and who we are. I want to tell you, there should be a difference in believers Amen. and non-believers. Amen. Amen. There is a difference how we love people and care about people. Yes. Yes. There is a difference. Yes. Now, we've tried to relegate that down through the years. We've tried to say that you got to wear certain things and do certain things and Hair has to be a certain length, and facial hair, none of that. And you can't show off your sexy elbows, and you can't show off your sexy knees. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. That is Amen. a cheap imitation yeah. of holiness. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. A cheap imitation. Come on. And what God wants, what God desires, is not all of those things, but what God wants is is that we love each other and we care about each Amen. other yes. and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. 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 Good. Bring it. Bring it. That's it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. I like that. Yeah. 
Look again with me at Ephesians 3.16. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Well, it's his prayer for the church. Again, he didn't call for big buildings. He didn't call for any of those kinds of things. He said, I want you to know me and know who I am, who I am, and I want you to know me in the intimate most, most parts of yourself and the intimate most parts of who I am. Come on. I've said it a million times, I'll say it a million times more from this pulpit. I'm not interested in growing five miles wide and a half inch deep. Amen. Right. My on. desire, my desire is that we would know Christ in His intimacy Amen. and the knowledge of who He is yeah. and Amen. how He operates. Yeah. And Jesus Christ would be your one single desire in your life. Amen. 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 Sometimes I say for things profound. This morning I had a profound moment. I said to my wife, I said, Kathy, I want to tell you that if 12 people could rock the world, certainly 250 people could rock the world for Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 If they rocked all of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth and they were filled with the Spirit of God Amen. and that God blessed and added to the church Amen. daily, then Amen. we too should have Amen. that kind of power. Amen. 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 And we should not accept some kind of cheap imitation of that. Amen. I'm not talking about emotionalism, you guys. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the, the phony baloney stuff that go. I'm talking about the Spirit of God that lives inside of you that can move mountains and love people that are unlovable. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. As I was studying for this sermon, I thought of this prayer that he prayed. I thought, that's, that's intriguing. Paul prayed that for the church because. I do that for myself. I can't tell you the number of times, and I've told you this before, this building will creep you out <laughs> when nobody else is in. <laughs> you say this is a holy place. I'm sorry, you guys. This is I saw people who made this stuff. I saw the people. They ain't so holy. <laughs> Sorry, Billy. <laughs> God, forgive me for that, man. I'll get you. They're not so holy. And Brian, Brian did this. And God forbid that Brian would be a holy guy. But he did some of this stuff. And this is not holy, you guys. This, these drums, oh, you say, I don't like the drums anyway. Well, the drums aren't holy. But guess what? Now there is the grand piano. Exactly. Amen. It's not holy. Come on. That's right. There's nothing holy about that. But there are times when I come in here, and this is just a building. It, that's all it is. And I walk these aisles, and I put, say, God, would you come in an unbelievable way this Sunday morning? Right. Amen. Would you and your spirit strengthen and empower people like you never have before, ever, in the life of our church? Would you Amen. do that, Lord? Would you do that? Bring it. Help us, yes. Lord. And I pray that very same prayer and say, God, would you do that? I don't care about a building. I don't care about any of that kind of stuff. But God, would you fill your people to the brim Amen. and overflowing? Amen. 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 is that God answers prayer. Amen. God answers prayer, doesn't he? Yes. Because I know people here that are full to overflowing. Amen. Some of you are still under the water, but you'll get up after a while. Amen. Amen. You will. What effect would a single church 
have on what God had set Paul aside to do with the kingdom of God. I mean, Paul's a world-traveling evangelist, a persuasive preacher. He started a number of congregations by the time. Ephesus is now just one local church. They can make all the difference in the world. You see, the local church is the face of God to the world. Right. Yes, it is. I want to talk for just a second, real quickly. If you claim this is your church, then don't be a devil out in the world. Come on, Pastor. Say that again. Yes. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> if you claim this is your church, then don't be a devil out in the world. Come on. Joey used to work at Skyline. It was a great job for him. You know when they, when the Skyline people did not want to work Sunday afternoons? You know why? The church people would come in there and they would disintegrate the place, first of all, and they were lousy tippers. Terrible tippers. Terrible. They would tip them on, they, they'd give them track. That was the tip. Hello. Some people are just cheap. Hey, <laughs> you got it, Bill. You got it. There you go, Billy. That's it, honey. It is what it is. <laughs> okay, I gotta focus now. <laughs> like Cruz said to Trump the other night, breathe, Donald, breathe. <laughs> Let's just say you are in the market to buy a new car. A rich relative has passed away and willed you several million dollars. Wouldn't that be great? Amen. And now that you have always, all that money, you figured it's time to buy the new vehicle you've always wanted. You go down to the local car dealer, you kick a few tires, you buy, drive away the car of your dreams, but a few days later you start to experience some problems. The car needs some work. The engine is running rough or there's a sh shutter in the chassis. As you drive down the road, you figure it should be under warranty, so you take it back to the dealership. But well, once you get there, you find that the workers are rude and unhelpful, the shop is dirty, the mechanics are rough to your car, and it seems they can't figure out how to fix your car. On top of that, it appears they have no intention of honoring the warranty that you thought covered the car to begin with. They expect you to pay all the repairs on the vehicle up front. Anybody have that? Now, how would you respond to that kind of treatment? I might call the Better Business Bureau, I might call a lawyer. Well, one thing's for sure, I'd probably never go back and buy another car from that place. Mm -hmm. There are some people who would not only not go back to that dealership, but they would never buy that brand of car ever again. Now, that was the problem with the dealership. The problem they was that it wasn't that they couldn't sell cars. The problem was they couldn't sell cars. They could do that. They sold one to you. Their problem was the workers forgot why their company existed. Mm -hmm. They thought the company existed for their comfort. They thought that once the car was sold, it didn't matter how they treated the customer. And because they thought those things, they lose clients. People will stay away from the dealership by the droves. The workers have gained a bad reputation for their company and even for the car they sold, and the company will fail if those workers keep that up. The same problem can happen within the church. A church that forgets why they exist will not stand. Right. Come on. A church that gets into thinking that church is all about their comfort level. A church that forgets that their primary job is to make disciples of their friends, their neighbors, and relatives and then teach those new believers how to live strong lives for Christ. Loose translation of Matthew 28. A church that forgets that those things, is going, those things are going to fail. And not only will they fail, but they'll tarnish the God's reputation because they are the face of God to the world. The world, listen to me for a second, the world looks to see how we treat our spouses. The world looks to see how we treat our co-workers. The world looks to see how we treat our friends. 
And they also look to see how we treat our enemies as well. Come on. They watch because they want to see Jesus. And they want to see if Jesus has made any difference in our life whatsoever. I find it interesting, though, that Paul didn't lecture the church, like I am, <laughs> what they were supposed to do. He didn't lecture them. He prays for them. He prays for three things. Here's the three things. He prays that God will strengthen them by His Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He prays for them that they will be strengthened by God's Spirit. Amen. Yes. Secondly, he prays that Christ will dwell in their hearts by faith. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, he prays that they will be rooted and established in, in love. Why would Paul pray for this? Why not just simply tell the church to do it? Well, two reasons occurred to me. They kind of overlap. First, Paul prays for God to do this for the church because he realizes the church isn't designed to operate purely as a social organization. Amen. Now, I'm not against getting people. In fact, I'll stand on my head. I don't know if I can still do it or not. I'd stand on my head to get people in church. I really would. But I also am concerned that we could also do absolutely everything in a worldly way to get people here, and they think that that is what Christianity is. Now... The church can exist and it can survive without God's direct involvement, but it can't thrive and fulfill the mission that God wants us That's to, right. to Come on, Pastor. Right. Speak it. The church is a human endeavor. The church of the wealthy and strong, the church of the highly successful, in order for a church to be everything God intended it to be, it has to have God's Spirit empowering that church. Amen. 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 Secondly, if a church tries to go it alone without praying for God's presence and power, then that con congregation runs the risk of having all kinds of problems. You say, what kind of problems are they going to have? I'm glad you asked. Galatians 5 says this. tells us why the Spirit is not present in a church. Then you're likely to have this. Galatians 5. You're likely to have sexual immorality. You're likely to have impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hated, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, look sometimes at the 20th century church, you guys, or the 21st century. I guess we're in 21st. I better get in that. Look at the church of today. Let me read that over to you again. Sexual immorality. Has sexual immorality ever hit the church within the last, say, 15, 20, 25 years? Has it ever hit the? Has it ever hit the church? You better believe it has. Yes, it has. Sexual immorality runs rampant. We lose pastors and people alike all the time because of sexual immorality. Amen. I want to tell you, husbands, something. You husbands love your wives. Amen. Don't go tomcatting around. Amen. I can say that now because I'm an older pastor. I couldn't say that before. I remember, I remember when, uh, when I was in uh, Wiseman's class, he said, he said to us, as we all sat there in a leadership class, he said, listen, if you guys are going to be pastors, and you want to tomcat around, get out of the ministry before you start tomcatting, because I don't want Amen. that on our record. Yeah. I'm still in it. Hallelujah. I am tomcatting. Not doing any of that kind of thing. You might say to me, Scott, come on, get real. You don't expect me to behave that way, do you? You do expect us to believe that just because a church is self-sufficient, it doesn't really rely upon God as much as it should, that they'd have problems like that, do you? Yes, I do. Yep. You go through that list, and I want to tell you that every one of those things have happened 
to churches that are self-reliant. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. I know of a church, this guy says, I know of a church a long time ago was a very large and powerful congregation in our brotherhood. They had at least 600 people in attendance every Sunday and then even a radio program with radio technicians and special mic for broadcasting their services. It was the in-church to go to. That, that brings me to another thing while I'm talking about that. We think we've got to be the hipster church, folks, these days. We've got to be hipster. We've got to have all the hipster stuff. I want to tell you, God doesn't care about the hipster stuff. Amen. Come on. Now, I want to be as socially relevant as what we possibly can be. But I don't want to be hipster at the cost at the cost of being the church that God wants us to be. Amen. I'm not going to change hipster for spirit and empowerment. Amen. It's not going to happen. Amen. At least not while I'm around. So we're not hipster. We're square. That, that's, uh, that's okay. They had at least 600 people in attendance every Sunday. They had a radio pro. Oh, yeah, I read that to you. It was the in church to go to. They had doctors and lawyers, politicians and judges. Anybody who was anybody went to this church. They had power and they had wealth and they had influence and they relied upon those things far more than upon God. One of the men in that congregation was a very wealthy individual who tithed generously to the church. Whenever there was a financial shortfall, he'd make up the difference. And because of his power and because of he was wealthy and because he was so generous to the church, they made him an elder, but one day it became known that the elder was an, adul an adulterer. That sort of sin is hard to keep secret for very long. Amen. And when the preacher found out about the dis indiscretions, he forced the man to resign his position. Now, I'm not sure if it was because the preacher's decision was so unpopular in the church or not, but a couple years later, the preacher resigned and moved on, and when the preacher moved on, the elder was reinstated because he was wealthy and influential man, but he wasn't a repentant man. He wasn't sorry for what he had done. Mm. Yeah. About five years later, this large, powerful, and wealthy congregation began having financial difficulties. They were running in the red, and they couldn't understand why. When they investigated, they found that the deacon who counted the offerings was juggling the books and skimming off the money for himself. Oh. Where was the ugly smell of the scandal in the air? What were they to do? Well, the elder who had become disciplined and reinstated, he went out to the deacon's home and he burned the books. Two years later, that congregation split. The new church that was formed as a result refused to have elders in the church for the next 20 years. And the Spirit of God does not rule in a church. Amen. When somebody else rules in the church, when the authority of Jesus isn't present within a congregation, there is fertile ground for all kinds of sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And whenever you see those characteristics show up in a church, you know the Spirit of God is not present within that church. Amen. Amen. Lord, help us. God's Spirit is not in control. Amen. So what is your prayer, Pastor? Since Paul prayed for the church, and he prayed those things, what is your prayer? My prayer is that the Spirit of God would dwell within this place Amen. like never before. Amen. Amen. I'm praying that God would bow us over, man. I mean, Amen. mow us over. Amen. With what He wants to do within our, ourselves and within our people. I want God to move in this place like never before. Amen. Put the next Amen. thing up, you guys. I think it's the next thing. It's in the red there. Listen to this. Here's the three things that He prayed. I think it's a good prayer for ourselves. That God's church, that God will strengthen our church by His Spirit. Amen. Amen. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. You know when it's all hyped up when it's not. Mm -hmm. You know when it when it when when the glory falls and when it when it's Amen. just kind of trumped up, don't you? Oh yeah. You know that. Yep. There, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that is more of a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal than when it's just trumped up. 
Amen. We know that. Yeah. We know that when, it, when it's phony and when it isn't. And we pray that God's Spirit would reign supreme within this place. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Yes, Lord. Within your lives. Right. Amen. Within each one of us, because you are the bride of Christ. Amen. I want to ask you, have you ever prayed the prayer that says, Holy Spirit, will you fill me with all of your presence? Yes. Will you fill me with everything that you have for me in my life? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Yep. Have you ever prayed that? That God would fill you? If you can't, if you haven't, you can. Because I, I think that it is an oxymoron to say that we're unspirit-filled Christians. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Now we place a big emphasis on the second part of, of what happens to us spiritually. But I want to tell you, when you get saved, God imparts part of His Spirit in, or all of His Spirit inside of you. And it's not that you don't get all of God when, you, when you're saved. You get all of God. Right. All that He has for you. The problem is, is that you, He doesn't get all of you. Right. That's yep. it. Come yep. on, Pastor. Right. Because you still want your own way. Right. Come on. Amen. And there's little doors that he wants to open and he wants to go into and don't let him in. Yep. So he prays that the Spirit of God would dwell in us. Secondly, that Christ will dwell in here in our hearts by faith. Amen. That we would be Christ like. Yes. That we would be Christ-like in our family relationships. Yes. Come on. Amen. Yes. Come on. Yes. I remember when I, when I was growing up, my sister used to make me madder than a wet hen. Man, I was mad. I'd get mad at her. But we're not, I'm not a teenager anymore and I'm not a... Huh? God wants to purify your heart by faith, you guys. And, and strengthen your relationship. And he wants you Christ-like in your relationships. Amen. Third, that we will be rooted and established in love. Good. Amen. Yes. Amen. Heart on fire